Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Perfect RIA Podcast, What Works Wednesday edition. I'm your host, Matthew Jarvis, and with me today is author Denise Logan. And Denise, you and I met, actually, I want to share this, share this brief story. You and I met under interesting circumstances. One of my vices in life is to harass people on social media, and it's <laughs> something I'm working on. And you you had the kindness, very much kindness, to message me privately and say, hey, listen, I, I don't think you're accomplishing what you want to accomplish. I, I think you could probably have a different approach, but your your message was very, it, was, it felt like it was very much from the heart. Like, listen, I, I, I've never met you before, but I don't think you're accomplishing what you want to accomplish and maybe think about uh, a different way. So I, I want to publicly thank you for having that kindness and that wisdom. Uh, but with that, with that introduction, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'm so glad we had that corrective experience because otherwise I would have to call, I would have to start off with Matthew Paul Jarvis. <laughs> what are you doing? Get off social media. Stop, Stop this. being that. Yes. Stop <laughs> being mean to these people. Just let them be. <laughs> well, do you, to tell us a little bit about about your practice, about your book, about what, what you're up to. I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of really great things. I mean, I guess I've just asked seven questions. I guess here's my biggest question. You've taken time to write this book. You've taken time to be on the podcast. You, you've done a lot of advocacy in the industry. Tell us about that journey. Tell us about how you got here. Yeah. So I would say I am the one that's not like the others among the guests that you often have. Early life, I started as a mental health professional, and then I became a lawyer. Interesting. And your listeners are thinking, why didn't she use that good mental health skill to keep her from becoming <laughs> a lawyer? She seems like a nice girl. And I built a law practice in Washington, D.C. We grew to a quite large size. And then I made a super ugly, choppy exit from my own business because I waited too long. I was burned out and had reached the point where I would have almost given my business away to exit. I got rid of my house and bought a motor home and took off for what I thought would be six months to clear my head and turned into several years where I traveled all over North and Central America. That's a whole other conversation wow. for us to have, probably yeah, with a is. beverage. I think. Yeah, yes. And I came off the road and joined a friend's business who was preparing it for sale. Over the next 10 years, we took that business to the market three times and he could not let go. Oh, so, so it went to the market, but he came back. He stepped back from the line. He, yep. Yeah, he got to the sale point and then pulled out three times. And I thought, isn't this interesting? You could be me and wait too long and be ready to give it away. Yeah. Or you could be him and go too early and not be able to reach conclusion. So I left and did a research study to try to figure out why business and practice owners get stuck hmm. and how to help them navigate it. So for the last 13 years, I've been working one-on-one -on -one with business owners and their advisors to help them navigate the emotional obstacles to letting wow. go when it's time to sell. Because it is not just a transaction, it is the single largest emotional transition in an adult's life, that time when we leave our work. Yeah. So yeah, that's my journey. Compounded when you're when you're not just leaving a work, but selling something you've you've built. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, one of the things that I see, Matt, is that, you know, we step into this role as trusted advisors, right? I'm going to, people who are only listening can't see I'm using my air quotes to trusted advisor. But how do we become a trusted advisor other than simply putting that label on ourselves? And I think that comes from being willing to have the difficult conversations with our clients yep. and to be willing to step away from just the tactical and transactional aspects of the money part mm -hmm. and step into what is your client actually going through? Yeah, no, that's super deep, Denise. I've had a couple of clients recently sell businesses, but actually a, a kind of an interesting direction I'd love to take is we have a lot of younger advisors that listen to the podcast. By the way, I hate saying younger advisors because that puts me in the group of <laughs> The not younger advisors, <laughs> but are in multi-generational firms. I grew up in a multi-generational firm, whether that's a family or just generations of advisors. And I talk to younger advisors who feel that the, the senior advisor is stuck, that they will never sell. And, and I think to your point exactly, they don't understand that this advisor often built it from absolutely nothing. And yes, there's the financial and there's the legal and there's the tax and there's all of that, but there's this enormous 
emotional portion that I think, especially in a somewhat male dominated industry where nobody wants to talk about that, right? We want to parade on stage. Look how big my practice is. Look how much money I'm making. Look at how old I am. And I'm still doing all this great work and not Denise, to your point of like, I'm, Hey, I'm terrified to sell this thing because what do I have left? Who am I right? Here's my yes. little Zen Ooh, poem that I like to use. If who I, if what I do is who I am and I no longer do, do I not exist? Wow. Yeah, no, that's it. And I, I would say for anyone listening for whom that doesn't like rock you in your chair, you definitely need to not just read Denise's book, but you need to dive deeper into this emotional space, right? If you're talking to a client, whether they're a business owner or not, and you're not understanding that what they do is at least in the moment who they are, and you're not getting that, like you're missing such an opportunity to be a valued advisor, a trusted advisor. And let's just put some context around that, Matt. You know, everywhere we go, the first question we're asked is, what do you do? What do you do? Yeah. Whether it is relevant or not. You know, I was getting my hair done and the gal sitting a couple of chairs down from me shouts over the blow dryers. So what do you do? And I'm like, what? Like we're getting our hair done. What is, what is that question? And so... But for someone who has either lost their job, we're going to have a lot mm -hmm. of people who lose their jobs in this current economy, or for a business owner who is selling their business, they're still going to be asked that question, what do you do? And I have a belief about that question. Mm. I actually think it is a social pegging question. Oh, totally. Totally right? is. When mm -hmm. I'm asking, when someone is asking you that question, what do you do? The answer that you give in their brain, they're like, am I above you or am I below you? Should I be kissing up to you right now or should you be kissing up to me? And for anyone who's listening who doesn't think that's the case, here's your homework. For the next three weeks, I want you to answer that question with something other than the way you make your money. Mm -hmm. You answer it with something that you unconsciously believe is beneath you, whatever that is. So here's what I do when someone asks me that question. I say, about what? I love that, yes. What do you do? About what? About and what? inevitably that kind of, it shifts the conversation. And they'll say, well, uh, like, well, what do you do for a living? Wait, you want to know how I earn my money? Yeah, would well, you like to know my blood pressure while we're talking about right. it? What's, oh, well, what else? I, I yeah. just want to relate to you. Can we agree that there are thousands of other questions you could ask to relate to me other than how I earn my money? And it's about shifting the dynamic. And the reason I think this is so important for us to do as advisors is because everyone lean in, get close to the, to the sound. You too will leave your work one day. Yeah, that's true. Every one of us will leave our work voluntarily or involuntarily. Yep. And yet we live our lives as if somehow we will know when, we will have an opportunity to prepare for it, we will have both the physical and emotional, financial and emotional stand, uh, stamina to move through that. And that's a flat out lie. Yeah. So I spoke at a conference in October room filled with advisors, which I love, a very fun. I speak at about 75 conferences a year. Wow. Good and for from you. the stage, I said to this audience, so how many of you in your operating agreement have a mandatory retirement age? Hmm. Oh, a whole bunch of nervous little giggles went through the audience. <laughs> not very many. Yeah, I was going to say not typically in financial services. But why? That's a great question. Yeah. Why not? And what are we signaling to our young people in our firms when we as founders or senior leaders do not have an exit date? And I, you know, I've seen it for many years that what we see are firms that look like grandpas and grandsons and all the dads were killed at war. Because what happens is we have senior professionals mm -hmm. who grow up and they hire young and those folks move up and they realize there's nowhere for me to go. Mm -hmm. This old guy or old gal is hogging up all the food at the trough and they exit stage right. 
And then they hire some more young ones who grow up and exit stage left. Yeah. And the leaders begin to tell themselves a fake story, which is people don't stay. No one has commitment. Mm -hmm. When what they have really created is a business that no one sees their future in. And then we have older professionals who are no longer investing in their business. And then they have a business that they can't even sell. Yeah. Yeah. And the gap gets wider and wider, right? It, boy, there's so many, so many pieces there. Denise, this is really fun stuff. I, I on that, that question about what do you do, I'm always looking for um, people who downplay what they do. So if I ever have that discussion with somebody, the person that's really, advisors are the worst at this, um, but people that really try to upsell what they do, I think, you know what, you're not really the person I want to be talking to. I actually, I have a friend and when someone asks her what she does, she says that she's a yoga instructor. Now, she's actually a tenured, tenured university professor in economics, but one of her passions is to teach yoga. And she got tired of that question and the pegging that went along with that. And so she just says, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm a yoga instructor. And uh, she looks for people that have disdain. And then she knows that those just aren't people that she wants to spend any time with. But I guess kind of a side note, let's talk about younger advisors. We have yeah. a lot of those. So if you're a younger advisor, you're working with that, that scenario you described, Denise, where there's no dads in here, there's grandchildren and there's grandparents. <laughs> what can you do as an advisor to proactively get that, that discussion going? Let's, let's go that direction. What, if I'm a younger advisor, I'm stuck, I'm, I'm stuck. I see that everybody ages out of this or in the middle, they all drop out. What can I do to start, that, to start making that change? Yeah. Very first thing is how will you, younger or older advisor, how do you want to leave your practice? Even as a young oh, advisor, sure, sure. are you beginning, you know, we'll steal a line from Stephen Covey, begin with the end in mind. How will you plan to leave your practice? How will you know when you've yeah. had enough and how will you exit? And that would be the first question. Ask yourself, okay. how will I know? And then launch that conversation with your senior folks in the firm. Hmm. I've been thinking about this. How will I know when it's time for me to retire, especially for advisors who are working with business owners? You want them to exit their business mm -hmm. and harvest the wealth so that you get the AUM. Sure. It makes me think of a post that you did a couple of months ago, Matt, that was talking about, should we take advice from people who haven't walked the walk? Sure. Yeah. Is their advice worthwhile? Well, P.S., by the way, who are we to be advising owners about leaving their business when we don't have a plan? Yes. Oh, yeah. Or we don't have an estate plan or we're not doing our own retirement contributions. Yeah, all of those things. And I guess there's, there's sort of that, that moral point. But there's also, I think consumers, clients know this. They know when there's incongruency, right? We, we can sense when people are not congruent in their stuff. And so I, I love this, Denise. If you're trying to encourage a senior partner to retire or to move on or to whatever. But Denise, to your point, you have no plan yourself. Yeah, it's easy to throw stones, right? Yeah, you should really have a plan for leaving. Okay, what's what's your plan? Even if you're 23, what's what's your plan at the end of this game? What is your plan and how will you know? Because that's where we're moving forward. And I, when I'm working with a business owner, I say to them, you know how to choose the best advisor for you, whether it's a banker or a lawyer, yeah. a financial advisor, is to ask them about their exit strategy. And anyone who doesn't have an exit strategy for their business should not be advising you. I love that. Because it means they haven't even begun the emotional work of contemplating mm -hmm. their exit. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about is every advisor who, sh who is chosen should be technically proficient. That of is course. the bare minimum, right, that any client can expect. Yeah. So technical proficiency, tactical prowess, those are not differentiating things. What is Just a differentiator? Stakes, right? Correct. Yeah. What is a differentiating factor is, you know, I too know that I will leave my business. And here's how I'm thinking about that and how I'm preparing. And that creates an advisor who is more emotionally present and able to walk through the difficult steps with an owner. Instead, for those who pretend that they will never leave, mm -hmm. or those who pretend they will never die, or they will just magically know the when, why should a business owner trust you? 
Yeah, yeah. Why should they trust you? And, and are you, in fact, giving them the best advice that you could give them? Right. If you haven't worked, and I love this, this mindset, Denise. If you haven't worked through this yourself emotionally and mentally, how could you possibly advise someone else to do a journey you've never gone on? Yeah, mm-hmm. especially a scary journey like this, right? This isn't a hey, let's do a mental exercise on if I won a million dollars. Okay, well, that's that's fun. That's a good one. But this, all right, my sense of purpose, right or wrong, the who I am, right or wrong, that's going to go away or change dramatically. And I haven't worked through that sort of like not addressing death, right? Like clients don't want to talk about dying and they don't want to talk about estate planning. And if you as the advisor haven't done your own thinking through that, boy, it's gonna be a tough discussion. You know, my early life as a mental health professional was in two tracks. One is work and financial disorders. So people who are addicted to work and money. And the other is in thanatology, which is the study of death and dying. Hmm. And if you think about it, every article we read on MSN about the 10 mistakes that retirees make are all about the money. What if you run out of money? (laughs) But what if you run out of life? And we see people, you know, we know about transitions that people face in other parts of their life. When yeah. the last child, you still have kids at home. Right yep, now. I do. Yeah. Yeah. But when the last one leaves home, what do we call it? Yeah. Empty nest. Empty nest. And we know that for a business owner, the business is the last child that leaves wow. home. Sometimes we joke and say they treat it like it's their baby. Heck yeah, they do. Yeah, they, they birthed. They, they grew birthed that thing it. From yes. Yeah. Right. They raised All it through the, the terrible for decades, twos. likely. Yeah. All of that. And so for many couples, business owners, what happens is they come close to the end and they look at their spouse and they realize, oh, I'm going to do stuff with you. I don't know you. I don't even know if I want to know you. And that's a huge element. But when Mm -hmm. we go through this with our children launching, we go through it with other families. So we go through it with the parents of our kids, friends. Sure, sure. A business owner is going through this almost virtually alone. Mm-hmm. And culturally, we don't, we don't often talk about what's happening. So we think, well, you're going to get a big sack of cash. You should be totally thrilled. But here, so here's another, here's another action point for people to be thinking about. Please. Okay. What does work provide for you other than money and financial security. Let me ask the question again, just to think, what does work provide for you other than money and financial security? Because the sale of the business will provide for those things. That's why we're selling, because you're going to get your money. Make a list of 15 distinct things other than money and financial security that you're getting from work. Hmm. What do you, what comes to your mind, Matt? What do you get from work other than Oh yeah, money? well, so this is where that gets really tricky, right? Because there's there's social validation that comes from that. There's there's into, a huge sense of accomplishment. There's uh, just, just the pure dopamine that, I mean, you mentioned the idea of people who sell their business and then they realize like, wow, now I need to spend more time with my spouse, but your business provides you so much constant validation and feedback and especially a successful business. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of things. It provides structure. Yes. Right, structured to our day, our week, our year. It provides a place to go. During COVID, we were all like, when can I get out of this house? And your spouse was thinking that too. When can you get out of my house? It provides intellectual stimulation, friendship, but then even some of the things we don't like to admit to ourselves, Mm -hmm. which is power. Yes, yeah, especially as a business owner. Right, lots of things. And so make that list of the 15 things, and it gets harder, right? One, two, three, four, five, those you're like, oh, I know those, oh, nine, 10, 14, you have to really dig deep. And those those needs that work is meeting do not go away just because you get a big sack of cash. Mm -hmm. So the question is, where will you begin getting your friendship other than inside your business? Where will you begin getting your intellectual stimulation? And to be getting those now while you are in your practice or in your business so that you already have some foundation and grounding for all of those needs because we are unlikely to meet one, have one single thing 
after we leave our business that meets all of those needs. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's not going to. And so for an advisor who does this work for themselves, right, you make your list so that when you're having the conversation like Matt, you and I are having, you can ask your client. And when your client doesn't have an answer, you can prompt with one. Well, I get this. What do you get? Oh, and I get this. So it's a conversation. And what you're signaling to your client is, I too am preparing for this and not just saying mm -hmm. I'm preparing. Mm -hmm. Well, Denise, I wrote that down as an action item for myself. So a list of the 15 <laughs> things. No, I, I really did. It's, um, I remember early in my career, and, I, and I'm sure you can re relate to this. I thought what I needed was more technical knowledge. And you do need deep technical knowledge, right? We 100%. But, and I would think, oh, this exercise, I don't need to take the time to do this exercise. What I need to do is I need to read the taxation of business sales, depending <laughs> on the structure. And you do need to be aware of that if that's your niche. But I'm telling you, an exercise like this, I don't need to tell you, I'm telling our listeners, this will both rock your own world and it will incredibly increase your ability to deliver value to your clients on a level that you didn't know was available previously. Yeah. Well, Denise, I would love to chat for hours on this. In fact, we'll have to do a couple more episodes together because uh, I've got a whole bunch more questions, but I wanna make sure our listeners all do, make this list of the 15 things that you get from your practice. Be sure to go to Denise's website, denise-logan.com. Um, you can get the book on Amazon, but those of us that are authors like Denise and I, we know that Amazon is not a great place to get books. Uh, go to Denise's website and get her book. And even if uh, business owners are not your niche at all, the same concepts apply to someone that's retiring. Maybe they don't have quite as, I bet they probably have just as much. The, uh, the seller's journey, an absolute must read. Denise, any parting thoughts for our audience? I, again, thank you so much for your wisdom today. Yeah, I might just give a little uh, piece about the book and how to use it. Yes, please. Because it's written as a business fable. It's the story of an owner one year after he exits his business. And he goes on a trip across Glacier National Park with his banker, his lawyer, his financial advisor, and the buyer who bought his firm. And right now your listeners are thinking, that sounds like a murder mystery. I was gonna say, a murder or a joke? <laughs> yeah, they walk into a bar, yep. But as they cross the glacier, they're relating the physical obstacles they faced to the emotional obstacles that he oh. faced in exiting. And it's a book to give to a client or a prospect to help them begin to think about the emotions that they're facing, but also the way the book is written. When you give that book to a client, they, as they're reading it, they are putting you in that character's role in the book. Brilliant. And they're thinking, gosh, I wonder if Matt could be my Jim. It's already building connection and trust, and it gives you the opportunity to talk with them about what's coming up because A, they're going to have language for it. And they're going to say, if you thought to give me this, you must know what's going mm -hmm. on under the surface for me. Totally. Well, that's, that's brilliant. Denise, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate your insight. Thank you for your book. Uh, again, be sure to check that out on denise-logan.com. And Denise, until we do another episode together, happy planning. I love it. Thanks so much, Matt.